professor of philosophy at the University of Montreal in Canada. Philosophy of biology is different things. Uh, so sometimes it's how biology helps us rethink some classical philosophical problems. So one example of this is how, you know, biology's efforts to understand how to define a species or to identify species helps us understand the relationship between you know, a classical philosophical problems of the relationship between types and tokens. So individuals and the class they belong to. And philosophy of biology sometimes is also using philosophical insight to possibly, if not improve, better understand aspects of biology. So it, it's a kind of this dialogue between traditional biological problems and traditional philosophical problems. And when it works well, hopefully both gain from the interaction. There, there's a traditional view of knowledge that basically says that they basically sees pursuit of knowledge as just trying to get a better understanding and you just use the tool you, you need and the tools you can reach. So to me there's not, I, I, don't, uh, I don't adopt a view of disciplines as being very rigid. Um, so the fact that I'm in a philosophy department, I, I mean I could be in a biology department or I could be in a history department and what defines your approach is more in terms of the questions and the tools you adopt than uh, you know the letterhead uh, that you get when you get hired um, so it's it's more I mean I am not a scientist I don't do any field work um, I am interested in empirical claims I am interested in theoretical claims um, but what makes me a philosopher is more some of the problems I'm interested in than the department I'm in. That means that if sometimes I'm interested in more scientifically focused problems, then what I'm doing is maybe less philosophical at that time. And uh, then it's just a question of how you approach a problem that determines what kind of uh, disciplinary approach you're adopting at that moment. So these classifications, it, one must understand that departments are kind of the result of the sociological evolution of the, you know, human institutions. So why do you have philosophy and let's say history in different departments instead of one? Or why do you have biology and chemistry in different departments instead of one? That's a contingent result of the evolution of universities. So you shouldn't get too bogged down. I mean, these are real facts that you have to take into account, but you shouldn't get too bogged down in what happened in the 19th century, the construction of universities, and how you view your own field of inquiry. First thing to, to keep in mind is that, in my mind, some of the best philosophers of biology have been biologists, right? So again, this is not just a disciplinary thing. Um, I think where philosophy of biology is, can, be, can contribute to biology, is when it puts into question um, the types of objects that biology should be looking at and the types of relationship that biologists should be looking at. And so, for instance, uh, there is a, a very positive dialogue between philosophers and biologists about whether we should view species as whole individuals, right? Now, it seems purely theoretical, and it is, in some sense. But let's say you adopt a view of species as whole individuals, then you can ask questions that you would be able to ask if you don't consider species as emergent wholes. So you can start talking about, let's say, species selection or species evolution. Uh, I'm not saying it occurs, that's an open question, but that's a type of interplay between philosophers and biology where something that at some level is a purely philosophical question can have some research dividends, if you will. And there are ex other examples with this. I mean, just the history of the re relatively recent history of our field uh, of, of philosophy of biology shows a lot of collaboration between philosophers and biology. So group selection is another example. A lot of good work on group selection has been done 
you know, in dialogue between philosophers and biology and biologists. Uh, so some of those are some of the most salient uh, features, but you can see it in Evo Devo, you can see it in um, symbiogenesis work, you can see it in various areas where basically a, a theoretical, let's say a more abstract theoretical perspective uh, is helpful at a given moment in the transformation of a field or transformation of a field of inquiry. The biologist Lee Van Valen was looking for definitions of evolution that didn't focus exclusively on genetic descriptions and how to better link development and ecology. So I actually think a good definition of evolution is how environmental constraints affect the development of organisms and other biological systems. The focus of my inquiry has been to understand what we mean by survival of the fittest. So when we think of evolution, the, you know, the traditional slogan is survival of the fittest, but then the hard work comes in defining and measuring this fitness. And so I've been interested in trying to find measures of fitness that apply for a broad class of biological phenomena. And by doing so, this has led me back to traditional philosophical questions about biological individuality. So if you say survival of the fittest, well, you must ask yourself, survival of the fittest what? Are we talking fittest gene, genotype, genome, organism, deem, species, and so on? And when you start wondering at what level does fitness apply, uh, then you think about how is the biological world structured into, let's say, biological objects. So I've been very interested in uh, biological individuality uh, and how to think of, let's say, collective aggregates of organisms becoming, possibly becoming emergent individuals. And would, that, would it make sense to talk about the evolution of these emergent biological individuals? So right now, I'm deeply interested in, uh, let's say, multi-species assemblages, what we call communities in ecology, and whether it makes sense to talk about whole communities, association of different species, evolving as emergent wholes. So in some sense, it's, it's taking evolution by natural selection, it's taking very core aspects of evolution by natural selection, and trying to see if it applies to systems for which we, it wasn't intended or we hadn't tr tried to apply for. And this has been done by biologists, but the theoretical framework is still up for grabs in many respects. So that has been the focus of my research recently. The modern synthesis was a truly major development of biology in the 20th century because it, it provided, if you will, a lingua franca, franca to uh, a common language to analyze evolutionary processes both um, at a given time and across time right so it was a very powerful set of mathematical tools that relied on a view of inheritance that was focused on genetics and so it was developed before we knew about DNA and then it was enriched by DNA so this is, this was a very powerful development. The, that common language hinged on focusing on genetic inheritance and how um, allelic frequencies, so how types of genes distributed in a population. And the question now is, has become, well, is that sufficient to fully explain biological adaptations? And I think the positive development on the modern synthesis, so let's say an added layer, has been to look at other means of inheritance, uh, not to show that in some sense that they were wrong or that evolution doesn't work. On the contrary, it just means that the biological world has multiple ways of transmitting tra traits across generations. So the, uh, 
a very lively research project right now is in epigenetics, right? So focusing on how, uh, let's say, the, the development of some traits is affected by localized environmental conditions and how it affects uh, gene expression. So that, that's an important development. But there are other ways as well, you know, how to think about uh, symbiotic interactions as, in some sense, you can pass on your symbiont, so the organism you're in a symbiotic relationship with, to your offspring. So it is intergenerational transmission, but it's not clear that strictly genetic models can exhaust the process that's happening. So the, the big the big development on, so modern synthesis was an important step, and now it's, it's in some sense we're trying to see how exhaustive it is and whether we can enrich it with other means of inheritance in ways that still make sense in a Darwinian fashion. I have this ongoing writing project uh, that will probably turn out as a book uh, focusing on biological individuals, complex biological individuals, and their evolution and fitness. Um, I, I want to get to the point where we can think of communities and ecosystems as having adaptations. And this has implication for conservation efforts. Uh, but just even if we didn't face these, these very big challenges, it has consequences for how we conceive of evolution by natural selection in general. So I look at uh, various biological examples that, and see how they've been served by existing models of evolution by natural selection. So I look at the quaking aspen, I look at termite colonies, I look at Hawaiian bobtail squid, and I look at mud, you know, how the microbial communities in mud samples and try to see how various evolutionary models fare relative to these, to these models, to these organisms. And they're pretty well accounted for, but there are certain adaptations that demand some tweaks to evolutionary theory. And many biologists have, have uh, highlighted that Darwin was mostly, and, and a lot of uh, evolutionary biologists have focused on organisms that resemble us to a certain degree. So animals or insects. Uh, but there are many biological systems where traditional biological categories need to be re-examined. So for instance, biofilms, where you have multi-species communities that create polymers, right, to, to sustain their life cycle, their emergent life cycle. Well, what does it mean to be an individual, right? What does it mean to evolve? in this regard, where you have part that is living, the microbial communities, but you've got big chunks that is non-living, the abiotic polymers. So these are all examples that I try to analyze and see how can we offer a more encompassing notion of evolution by natural selection to both recognize that you have emergent biological individuals like ecosystems and see whether it makes sense or not to talk about their evolution or talk about their adaptation. And this is an ongoing project, and I hope to, to complete it in uh, the coming year or two. I just uh, co-edited a volume with a colleague from CNRS in Paris. Uh, it's called From Groups to Individuality at MIT Press. And we've, we've tried to, to get a bunch of uh, philosophers and biologists. So we've got 11 chapters and some half biologists, half philosophers to think about biological individuality when you've got associations of organisms either from the same species, like for a termite colony, for instance, or from uh, an association of organisms from different species. And it's, it's in the Vienna series in theoretical biology. So it is intended to provide better tools for biology, but it is also making a link to traditional problems in philosophy, trying to relate uh, parts and wholes. So how, what does it mean to have a part, to be a part of something larger, and what does it mean to be a whole that has its own reality? And uh, so it's uh, from groups to individuals, and it's at MIT Press, came out uh, in March 2013. 
And it's very interesting to see biologists and philosophers uh, getting at relatively similar conclusions, but with very different tools. And sometimes invoking empirical results, sometimes focusing more on, let's say, the coherence of our definitions and on the costs and benefits of adopting various definitions of biological individuality.